There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. Of course, I am Jay Campbell, and you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with a man by the name of Dr. Michael Amster. Michael, what is going on, my brother? Hey, Jay, I'm so thrilled and honored to be here with you this morning. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to get to meet your incredible, awe-inspiring group of uh, podcast listeners. And I'm excited for our conversation today. Well, thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. And you guys you guys have written an amazing book, which we're going to talk about on this podcast, but I'll give you guys his bio, uh, background and bio. He is a doctor with a specialty in pain management who is also a certified yoga and meditation teacher who wrote an awesome book, which they actually sent me, which I'm probably about 40% through, uh, which is called The Power of All. And we're going to be talking about that book uh, today. As But as I've been doing on the Jay Campbell podcast early here now in 2024, and today is very early, it's January 11th, I'm kind of asking my guests, Doc, um, you know, what their interpretation, what their perspective of, you know, the current, you know, call it geopolitical events of this world. I mean, obviously, you and I are very deep into the introspective and meditative world. But you, what do you see, of course, as, as I do my podcast, my uh, maintenance people get here and they're doing the lawn in the background. So you probably can hear that, but it won't be for very long. But uh, wh where do you see, you know, humanity going, you know, over the next three to five to seven years? Are you a half, glass half full, glass half full guy or glass half empty? Well, I'm definitely a, a glass uh, half full guy. Uh, that's just sort of my nature and my mindset sure. of things. Um, and it really ties into my work um, studying awe and other positive emotions and how they impact positively our, our human health. Um, but yeah, the world is definitely in an interesting uh, <laughs> precipice right now. And it sometimes feels like day to day, we could be going down down a, a pretty uh, dangerous slide towards our demise, or we could be transforming into a, a next level of consciousness. So I, I love the work we're doing um, with our book. And I, I know I'll get to talk a little bit about um, kind of the big picture of how awe, even though we're teaching people a personal practice of experiencing awe in the ordinary moments of their lives, that we hope that this will tra help transform the world. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's really lacking in our lives right now, if you just think about how busy and stressed out we all are, it's because we're not connected to the cycles and rhythms of our natural world anymore. Sure. Our technology devices, I mean, I think, Jay, you and I are I think in the same decade of age, but we can recall a time when yes. we didn't even have a cell phone or nope. a pager. You know, we grew up, we didn't have Facebook and Snapchat. And um, I've, I've watched my child, you know, who's now 22 grow up through that whole thing in her sure. teenage years of social media and how that adversely impacted her physical and mental health. And I think we're at that precipice of humanity needs to make a decision and we got to start setting boundaries and caring better for ourselves and each other. And, this planet we live on that's so phenomenally beautiful and awe-inspiring and filled with wonder. So um yeah, I, I'm I tend to be of the positive nature of where we're going, hopefully. That yeah, and wake I'm, up. And I, well, so I'm with you uh hundred percent, obviously. And I think people like us all have to choose the half full. And and again, every single day we create our reality, right? With our thoughts. So it's like where you place your thoughts is the consciousness that you ultimately create. The problem is that the media, you know, again, just use that word, the media, the narrative is victimhood. And too many people are caught up in that, and you know, the, the reality or, or their belief that they're, it's not, it, nothing is their responsibility that everything has been caused. You know what I'm saying? And I obviously, I know you guys talk about that in the book and we're going to get to that in a second, but like, it really just comes down to, are you personally accountable and sovereign for you as an individual, or are you not? And it's really easy, Michael, to not be, if all you do is focus on the narrative 
that's found in you know the daily news feed, the social media feeds, the television. And you know, I like to say people have to choose to be creative with technology versus consumptive. Because technology is a gift if you know how to harness it and leverage it, but only in the mode of creating with it. And so many people are literally, they go from Netflix to video games, to the news cycle, to porn, whatever it is, you know, something that sp spikes dopamine and right. they're not creating, it's just consuming, 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 consuming. And that's the whole difference. And, you know, if we as parents and obviously husbands and, 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 and wives and teachers and, and, and fathers, like we have to set the mold. We have to be the right example for our children and obviously for anybody else that we influence. And to me, you know, I don't get into the whole like technology has done this, right? Because I could do that. You and I could do that. Technology has enslaved everyone. My wife and I were literally, Michael, the other day at a senior citizen's home for something. I can't even remember why we were there, but like, dude, everybody in their 70s and 80s were like this. I don't have, I don't even know where my phone is, but they were like, you know, so we're like, kind of just like chagrin, like, my God, is there anyone that this is not affected by? But again, it's still a personal choice. Do you create with your technology and not let it control your life? Or is it the opposite? And I would assume too many people, it's the opposite. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, you're right. It's all about a choice. And if you have a level of conscious awareness about how technology is adversely impacting your life, then you'll make the choices where you'll give yourself uh, significant times off of your screen. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we do, my wife and I is, um, we have a, a Sabbath day, you know, from technology one day a week. And it's beautiful. It's, it's a day of being outside in nature, a day where we're not shopping. We're just, and being together and being out in the natural world and experiencing the joy and pleasures of this life and cooking together and all the great things that we love to do. And, um, you know, our, our, our human history has a lot of wisdom tied in and totally. it's a Judeo Christian tradition as of having a Sabbath day. I mean, that's kind of one of the cornerstones of, of, of the teachings from the Bible is to have a day of rest. <laughs> God created the world, you know, whether, whether you believe in God or not, there's a lot of wisdom in these mythologies of the Bible that, that we can really bring into our daily life. That's a and problem. Awe is one of them, actually, you know, there's a lot of talk about, yeah. Uh, let's, and there's let's a Hebrew word that. for awe. Yeah. <laughs> about well, let's get into your book right now. But like, it's yeah. funny you say that because that may be one of the biggest problems that so many people's God is technology. Mm. You right. know what I mean? And it's like people have lost their connection to nature and nature is God, as you know. I mean, it literally is the inspiration and creation of source energy, God, creative force, whatever you want to look at. But it's like people just think because technology is so all encompassing in their lives, which is, as you already said, is a choice that that becomes their God and they lose touch or, or connection with what really is God. Yeah. Or at least you it's know? their idol. <laughs> well, I mean, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, they bow down to the screen, but uh, yeah. let's, let's talk about the book. I mean, obviously I told you I'm about 40% of the way through it. It's very, very well written. Thank you so much right here. And as you can see, I've already started highlighting it, but, um, What's the story behind it? Yeah, so the story is, is that, um, I, as you know, I'm a medical doctor and I became interested in mindfulness uh, when I was in, um, as a teenager, I, I wanted to be a doctor since I was a young kid. I've always wanted to be a medical doctor. I just love the field of medicine, passionate about it, uh, I love helping people. And um, as the stakes got higher in my education into college, I started having panic attacks and, um, anxiety with taking exams. It just was really debilitating. And so I got to a point where I was at this crossroads. I either had to get on medication to manage my my monkey mind, as they say in the mindfulness <laughs> world. The drunk monkey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I a friend said, hey, go on this retreat. You know, try this uh Buddhist meditation experience. I did it this 10 day, it's called Vipassana practice. And yeah, sure. I'm very completely changed my life. Yeah. This uh, this amazing experience. And so I've now been a student, now trained as a Dharma teacher, meditation teacher. Um, I've led a, a meditation group called a, a Sangha, like a Buddhist meditation interfaith group um, as part of what I've done. And um, as a pain management specialist, I've been teaching mindfulness to my patients through uh, chronic pain groups for many, many years. And what I noticed was um, over the years that people really struggled with a sustained mindfulness practice. And I, mm -hmm. I'm sure, Jay, you've probably tried to you know, commit to a, a practice where you sit for 10 or 20 minutes a day and it's not easy, right? No, it's not. No. 
I don't know, our, we're busy and then distractions. And once we miss a day, we are hard on ourselves. And it's just kind of this really difficult cycle and spiral. Yeah. So my colleague and friend, Jake Eagle, who's a psychotherapist in Hawaii, um, we had had a conversation about five years ago about creating these, what would be the ideal micro meditation practice? Like if you could give someone a 15 to 30 second practice, what would that be like? And so we started playing with the idea of what we called initially microdosing mindfulness teaching people how these microdoses, And we, we found that by teaching this, people actually were having just as much benefit, if not more than sitting for longer periods of time each day. And it was very simple practices of just being very aware of your sensory experiences. And then I flew out to Hawaii where Jake lives about five years ago. And we um, were experimenting and exploring like how to really make this ideal practice work. Mm -hmm. And I had this, I call it an epiphany playing with the word awe, yeah. um, where one day I was making pancakes for in the morning for Jake and Hannah. And like most of us, when we're making pancakes in the morning with our kids or we're busy multitasking, we're like pour the batter and then we're off making sausage or bacon or we're making our kids lunch or we're making orange juice, whatever. We're just, we never sit there and actually enjoy the experience of watching a pancake cook. And so I stood there this time I was in this kind of meditative state. And I just watched the pancakes go from liquid to a, a solid puffy pancake in the matter of a minute. And I had this profound moment of awe. It sounds funny, but it really happened. And I, no, for I, felt, sure. I felt those tingles and chills and this aliveness and this like sense of peace and presence. And that's when we came up with the awe method. And the awe method, we use the word awe, A-W-E. It's an acronym that we've created. And it's a three-step process. And what we've done is we, we, we've taught this now to thousands of people, but initially we did a pilot study of our own patients. Then I approached UC Berkeley, um, the founder of the Greater Good Science Center. His name is Dacker Keltner. He's what we call the granddaddy of awe. He's been studying this emotion his whole career. Um, and he's an ex like the expert in the field. And when we showed him our initial data, he was like, this is incredible, you know, because what was unique about our approach was that all his research had pretty much been around extraordinary awe. They would take people and in a lab environment and make them watch profoundly beautiful videos of flying over Yosemite or the view from space. And then it give people a sense of extraordinary awe. But what we taught people to do is how to find on the ordinary. And what's really important about that is that it's sustainable, right? You can, you don't have to go to a rock concert or go to the Grand Canyon to experience awe. You, we can have an, a moment of awe right now, right? Just, just in this moment in the space right that now. we're in. Yes. Yeah. That's unfortunately, simple. unfortunately, the guy. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's driving me insane. But my, my, my lawn guy is like using the blower and the hacker <laughs> outside of my studio. So I'm like in the power of all moment, it's not happening, but it is happening. So anyway, continue. Well, you know that there can be some awe in, in this, in what's happening with the gardeners and what they're Absolutely. doing and caring for the lawn. And uh, <laughs> even though you're annoyed, you can actually be in awe of how much you're annoying yourself with the whole situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, it went away. And then I was like, oh, great. And then boom, he's right next to the window. But you're right, man. It's, it's where we place our consciousness. So it's like, it's not there, yeah. Michael. Continue. Well, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's like what we choose to attend our attention towards, right? And and how we choose to see things. And we'll talk about the, the methodology and how it works. But what's really amazing is that, so we, we, we had this opportunity to conduct some major research at the university. And um, at the height of the pandemic, when people were all sheltering in place, quite stressed out and depressed, this is in June of 2020, we commenced two very large, robust studies, one with 200 doctors and nurses on the front line with COVID, that we're dealing with a lot of mental health issues and then yeah. 300 primary care patients. And the results were really outstanding. I mean, we, we taught this in a 21 day program remotely using zoom. We followed people with daily metrics and long-term metrics. And we found, for example, a 35% reduction of depression. It's awesome. Um, which is equal to the efficacy of taking an antidepressant. And all we asked people to do was to spend about a minute a day. The practice takes about 15 seconds to do. So we said, hey, you know, practice a moment of all three times a day. That's all you had to do. And we saw, like I said, a 35% reduction of depression, 
about 25% reduction of anxiety, improvements in loneliness, improvements in burnout, improvements in overall well-being, decreases in chronic pain. So all across the board, every metric we measured, there was a significant improvement by people practicing a very simple practice of finding on the ordinary of their lives. It's beautiful stuff, man. Yeah. And so then Dacker, you know, when we first met, he said, this is the future of mindfulness. He's like, this, yeah. that's so quote him. He's like, this is the future of mindfulness is, and what he's tying into is this idea of um, that the micro practices, when we can take the meditation off the mat, off the cushion, right. like right. in the, in the Zendo or whatever, and right. take it out into the world. Like you can have a moment of awe while you're standing in line at the TSA checkpoint it's and true. be in awe totally of, true the quirky people around you and how people stress themselves out or how they're dressed. Um, there's just an endless amount, you know, airports are beautiful. A lot of airports are phenomenally beautiful and have incredible architecture and you can just be in awe of, of what's been created in that space. So it's everywhere around us and this practice is effortless and it's free, which, you know, as biohackers and we wanting to like improve our lives and our health, it's great when we have a practice that doesn't cost anything and we can do it anytime in any place. All is a choice. You know, I like to say, you know, people chase happiness and, and I always say like happiness is a transient feeling where joy is a state of being. So if you choose awe or joy, like you said, in any moment, at any point in place in time, which doesn't exist outside of the third dimension either, but it, while we're here in this density, it does, it, it's like it, everything can be beautiful. I, I mean, it, it, but, but, but it's, it's it's doing these micro meditations, you know, I call it introspection, contemplation, sitting in nature, whatever it happens to be. But you're right. It's really good. And I'm glad that you guys created this, you know, this construct or this thought process so that you don't need a lot of time because that's the problem for most people is they're, as you said, they're, they're so time crunched. They're so busy. They're so caught up in whatever it is that they have to do every single day, which obviously leads to stress, you know, parasympathetic nervous system issues lack of sleep. Uh, you know, I did a podcast earlier this morning with like the world's leading HRV guy. And like, we were talking about like how that's like such an amazing barometer of stress and how most people are so stressed. And, you know, everybody talks about sleep hygiene or hacking sleep. You can't hack sleep, but you can hack your sleep environment. But it's like, it's mind blowing how many people won't quote unquote meditate, won't contemplate, won't do any kind of inner work or contemplative practice because of the time idea, you know, that I have to sit there in lotus position for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And it's like, you guys are obviously teaching that that's not the case and that you literally can create these moments. And like you said, micro meditation sessions in 15 to 30 seconds. Exactly. You know, if someone says, I don't have time to meditate, I'd be like, do you have time to breathe? I was about to say. <laughs> you know, it's really literally the practice takes the cycle of a breath or two. It's that simple. Um, and you can do it while you're in line at the grocery store checking out and you have to wait 30 seconds. There's a chance to practice off. If you're at a red light, practice off. Um, you, you know, for me as a clinician, seeing patients, I have a moment of awe when I go in between patient care rooms to reset my nervous system. Yeah. And so yeah. I can be fully present and available for my next patient. I mean, this is an antidote for burnout, antidote for depression, anxiety. Um, and an overall booster of well-being. Um, and it's not, it is a mindset state for sure. Um, but I know we'll get into this, but there actually is science behind how this is working in our physiology and our body. And it is profound in terms of what it's doing to our chemistry and our nervous well, system. Let's get into that literally right now. So maybe just explain the actual, like, you know, the methodical, the, the method that you guys explained in the book. Yeah, sure. So I'd love to take the listeners through an experience of awe right now. So sure. I'm first going to talk to you a little bit about the three steps and some of the background, and then we'll go through an actual practice. And I will say just briefly that um, I know when I listen to podcasts, I'm usually driving in the car. So just be mindful. You know, some people have pretty profound moments of awe. And if um, I don't want you to get in a car accident, and you can always go to our website, thepowerofawe.com. We have uh, downloadable meditation, a workbook that's free and other extended practices on there as well to help guide you in that journey. Um, so the word awe has three letters. And so we created an acronym out of that and A stands for attention. And so what we're asking you to do is to just bring your attention to something that you value, appreciate, or find amazing. And 
you're going to intentionally let go of all the other thoughts of your day just for this short 15 second period of time. So just find that one thing. And if you can't find an object in front of you or something that you're listening to or something you're tasting or eating, you can also think of a memory of the past. It can be something as easy as like a memory of a sweet time you've had with a grandparent who's no longer alive or something like that. And then the W stands for wait. And so what you're doing is you're going to give yourself the gift of just a pause of waiting for a breath or two, but however long you want a little wait to digest and just really marinate that moment of awe. And the analogy I like to think of is that when you're walking with a friend through a doorway and they're ahead of you and they open the door and they hold it open for you, it feels really good when someone's caretaking you. Well, this is a moment you're caretaking yourself. You want to just give yourself this gift of time with no distraction and just really enjoy the awe. And then the third step is the E, stands for two things, a nice long exhale out. And when we take a longer exhale out, we stimulate our vagus nerve. And I know a lot of people know about the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, but this is the part of our nervous system that is our rest and repair state. Mm -hmm. You talked about heart rate variability. It's the part that increases our heart rate variability and brings us to a state of healing and repair. Simply by taking a long exhale out, and you can even try just making a long, ah, uh, right now, you know, you, you feel better. Like we instantaneously feel more present and grounded because the vagus nerve is attached to our bottom of our diaphragm and we get a nice nervous system reset. And then the E also stands for expansion. And what you're allowing to do is if you think about a moment of awe you've had before in your life, often you'll feel like a tingle or chills in your extremities. You get excited because there's a lot of energy that's released in your nervous system. So you want to accentuate that experience where you want to let that energy go out to your extremities. So um, some people are very visual. They can think of a light expanding in their body, or you just sort of let that experience of awe get bigger than yourself, your physical self and fill you up. So that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of the practice. So let's go ahead and have a moment of awe right now, and then we can talk about how it goes. So I want you to uh, find something in the space you're in right now that you value, appreciate, find amazing. And just fully be with that and take a nice long wait, a oh, short wait, sorry. <laughs> just be with that long, moment. Long, deep breath, I think is what you were really Exactly, a nice in. long, deep breath in and out. And then you take another breath in and a longer exhale out. And letting that expand and fill you up. Good. And then if your eyes are closed, you can just gently open them, noticing how you feel, if you feel a shift in your physiology and your nervous system right now. I've done four alls since you started talking about it, and I feel amazing literally right now. And what was actually the, what, what was in mind for you? What did you have a moment of awe on? Uh, I had three, but the first one was my wife. She's leaving today uh, to go take care of her dad, who's, Term, has terminal cancer in Southern California. And so it was just the thought process of not being with her for the next four days and just wishing her well and, you know, allowing her to her. She has very, very intuitive and a healer herself. So she, you know, to go back and do what she can for her father. I had a moment of awe um, looking at the poster behind you of, of um, Yoda <laughs> and just recalling my childhood and the star Wars figurines and just, this really in that space of how much I have um, found awe from the Star Wars story it's over amazing. the years. Do so. or do not. <laughs> there is no try. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny because both of us have massively dropped our energy from just doing it. Right. You and I were very much more passionate and engaging at the beginning of this conversation. And I can just tell like our parasympathetic nervous system has really, you know, de-engaged and we're now much more calm and much more centered and much more present in this conversation, which is exactly what happens. Exactly. I, our, our tone has changed. The speed of our use of words has slowed down quite a lot. Um, I'm feeling a sense of spaciousness, of euphoria, um, of calmness a piece. Um, mm. I feel more connected to you. Me too. The conversation. Me too. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Like I feel it like in my entire body. 
Like I, I literally have just like felt like just complete at peace. So imagine, let's say if we brought this into our relationships at home or at work in different places and be, part of being in a relationship is we have to, we work on, you know, stuff comes up and we have, we have to, to have navigate. Have, sometimes navigate talk, challenging conversations. So if you and your spouse share a moment of awe and then share about your awe, because there's something really powerful about sharing your awe is that awe is contagious. Yeah. The expression. Yeah. It really is. And so you sharing about the awe with your wife and what she's going through. And I just felt like a lot of compassion and my heart opening and, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a very powerful emotion. What the scientists call awe is they, they call it a, a pro-social emotion, which means that within awe are all these other beneficial, positive emotions like gratitude, generosity, empathy, compassion. Yeah. yeah. Um, the science has shown that people are more open-minded politically to being able to hold divergent views. Sure. And of yeah. course, right now, what we're seeing, I mean, we're almost like on this potential of a civil war, people's extremes of views politically now. We need all more than ever to really help open people's hearts and minds to be able to hold the space for each other. It's it's literally hemisync. It's like a micro version of hemisync when you've balanced the right and left, where there is no there is no picking a side. You're completely observationally neutral. Exactly. You really just kind of it the way I think of it is it opens your eyes to living life with childlike wonder and curiosity. Wonder, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, for those of us that have raised children or have children in our lives, we all we all have we all have some aspect of having children in our lives, and we can see how open and curious children are from the youngest of age up until probably they become teenagers and then they start to shut down as they become adults. But both of my daughters are not to interrupt you, but just to, to relate, both of my daughters are teenagers and we're um, and they're 15 and the one just turned 14. The other one's about to turn 16. And so they're at that age, man, like I, every night I still go to my youngest uh, and I attempt to hug her and tell her I love her. And she's like, dad, you know, you know, you know, you know, dad. And I, I still bring her in. I'm like, let's go bring it in. You yeah. know, and, and, and it's like the thought process of like, how much longer I can even do that. But obviously, you know, they mature and then they get to a place where you can do that again, or maybe not. I mean, it just depends on where they go and the ways they go. And all souls are sovereign and, you know, unique, right? We can raise, we can have two kids or four kids or five kids and every single one of them is so different no matter how you raise them obviously you raise them the same and one goes one way and one goes the other and you just have to just have awe at just the wonderment of like how is that even possible exactly yep i i see that in my kid and <laughs> both my brothers have five kids each and so <laughs> all the kids are so diverse and uniquely themselves and 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 they, they come out of the womb that way pretty much, totally. which is pretty awe-inspiring. You're like, wow, there's a certain sense of programming and identity that comes in even in an infant right out of the it, womb. It's it's crazy. It's, it's so true. They are sovereign souls when they come in. Mm -hmm. And I fully, I don't even want to say I believe anymore. I know they choose us as parents, mm -hmm. right? So there's a reason that they choose us to be their parent. And obviously a lot of it is you know, physiological, there's DNA, but there's also the intellect, the intellect and the intuition, you know, there's, again, there's the right brain and left brain aspects of us. And it's just mind blowing to see how they are separate. Um, and I raised, uh, my, my wife, my current wife's, uh, two of her biologicals too. So it's like, I had, uh, two boys and two girls, two of my bios and two are my bonus children, as I say, really three, cause she has a daughter too. But, uh, it's crazy how unique and different an individual each person really, really is. And how you just, like you said, you just have to just like be okay with it and not attempt to make one more like the other or anything like that, because they're just going to be who they are. Yeah. So this is a great way to apply the practice here of awe is that when sometimes we, we meet up with people in our lives where there's some conflict Mm -hmm. because they have these different personality traits that can kind of rub us the wrong way. And if we change our mindset and we can be in awe of that, that difference rather than 
defensive and reactive and or victimizing ourselves, it's a very different world we live in. Mm -hmm. um, and I find my, I, from doing this practice very consistently now for five years, I, I don't agitate myself um, with people really in a way that I, I used to do at times. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, you, you said it, you know, society is a powder keg. So it's like, it's not easy, you know, outside of your home or your studio or your office or seeing patients when you're just in the general public to maneuver and, and navigate without, you know, dealing with other people's issues, quote unquote problems. You know, again, problem is just a define a word that we use to define an observation. Right. But in, in truth, everything if you look at everything that happens to you or that you observe as a blessing it is mm -hmm. it, it, it's the labels that we put on the things that happen to us, happen to us or happen in front of us or around us or that we experience and i always say the the the, the true uh, growth of a master is when that person can look back you know at everything that's happened to them in the past but then everything that will you know are currently or future happen to them and just say no labels, no judgment of those events, but I want more of this and less of that. And then when I create that reality, it goes back to what you were just saying. I'm not reactive, you know, so I can choose to respond out of love, which takes time and effort and thought, or I can react out of fear, which is obviously the default survival programming that every one of us is built with, but mm -hmm. it's still a choice. It's still a choice, Michael, you know, and I, and again, choosing to respond out of love is not, always easy yeah well it gets a lot easier when we have um a level of what we call in our book spacious consciousness is which is yes. where awe resides like we were just talking about we this is really the work of the life's work of my co-author jake who's uh, a bit older than me and his psychotherapist and really into the human potential movement and conscious living and so he talks about these three levels of consciousness and that fear state that fight, flight, free state that most of us are living in, we're not aware of it, but we're always mostly in the state of what he calls safety consciousness. Sure. Um, where we're retracted and we're guarded. And we that's the state where depression and anxiety all reside in. Um, but we can use these tools. Um, one of them is the practice of gratitude. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And I, that's what heart math is actually about is the gratitude practice. And they see how that improves heart rate variability. Um, that takes us into what we call heart heart consciousness and it's a, it's a higher level of resonance and energy in our lives and when we think about what we're grateful for the same thing happens like we did when we had that moment of awe like our our tone of our voice is going to calm down we're in the place of appreciation and gratitude and then awe is at the highest state of consciousness what we call spacious consciousness and that's that transcendent spiritual state which is timeless and spacious it's deep peace and presence. I think of what the Buddha, what he taught was about the state of Nirvana, that's spacious consciousness. It's that timeless state of transcendent, pure present and being where you have a deep sense of peace and connection to all of life. Yeah. And awe is the fast, this awe practice is really, we believe the fastest way we know how to get to that state. Yeah. And it's we just beautiful. experienced it together. I mean, we felt connected and we felt deeply peaceful and present. Um, and so multiple times a day, we know from our research, the more you dose awe, the more benefit you get. We actually yeah. were able to measure this in our research studies. Three times a day was the minimum to see these benefits, but people that did it five times a day, 10 times a day, saw even more benefit. And what's the beautiful thing about this practice is that I think of it as like a training wheel. We're learning, like when you learn to ride a bike, now you don't yeah. have to think about it when you ride a bike, but when you get the mastery of this awe method, you don't really need the, the sort of step process anymore. You're just going to be walking through your life and you'll look at something, you know, pause for a moment and you'll have a moment of awe. Something will catch your eye. Something will catch your ear. A taste will catch your taste bud in a way that you're just like, wow, that is so rich and so deep. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, how many times a day do you, do you attempt to practice all? Well, I wouldn't say I really attempt. I don't have to make attempts because it's 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 effortless and it's just yeah. something that comes with my sense of being and presence. What we yep. hope to teach people in our study, what we talk about in our book too, is to go from a temporary state 
to a trait. So we leverage neuroplasticity that we can train our brains to become little, you know, beings of awe on this planet. Um, yeah, it was a poorly worded question. It was how many yeah, times a day do okay. you practice all? Well, you know, I I would say it Unhappy. might sound kooky, but I, it's probably somewhere in in the range of almost a hundred times a day. It's, wow, that's amazing. It's really, but it's so natural. I mean, it's a, a lot of things that capture offer me as light, how mm -hmm. light filters through um, the window and um, uh, and like reflects off leaves or walking out and walking to just to the park down the street with my dog. I'm in awe of my dog all the time and yeah. her quirky behavior, my spouse, you know, I have moments of awe just lying in bed. Yeah. Feeling, do, you, do, you have, feeling, do you have like a specific awe practice, like waking up in the morning? You know, that's a great question. And actually this is a great tip for your listeners. And this is what we call habit stacking. It's a, it's a familiar term um, in terms of learning new behaviors and to build them in our lives. So what we encourage you to do when you're starting this off is to stack an awe moment with something you already do on a routine basis, like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, um, making coffee. So I, I'm a, I love cup of coffee in the morning or a cup of tea. And so I use that as part of my daily awe practice of how I start my day is, um, and it can be any, any aspect of making that cup. It could be from, you know, I love a French press. So it could be from the opening, smelling the grounds, feeling them with my fingers, putting them in the, the press, watching them float around with a hot, steamy water, tasting it, smelling it, feeling the warmth of my hands on a cold winter morning, like all that. Those are all experiences of awe. And this is funny. We were talking about how technology is an awe killer. Think about it. A Keurig machine. It like literally destroys the experience of awe. <laughs> you don't get to smell, you, you know, it's in this little capsule and it's all sterile. You don't even get the pleasure of making a cup of coffee anymore. You That's a whole take... podcast that you and I could do on the dark, the, 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 the call them the parasitic side that just, this disturbs awe. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's so true. Like you, you lose out of the whole sensual experience of enjoying the richness of a cup of coffee or tea when you put a little pot in a machine and push a button and it, it doesn't even taste good. Let's be honest. He has anesthetized all. <laughs> and then you're contributing to the plastic waste problem and you're probably getting a lot of microplastic in your cup of coffee. <laughs> I was just going to say that you saw that what around in the last two days about how much microplastic the average human eats a year now. Oh, I know. I'm wait, I'm just waiting for that bomb to drop. I mean, I, I've talked to my friends cause I'm, I'm also, I don't practice functional medicine per se, but I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a participant in it as a patient yeah, and course. I'm passionate about learning more. And probably my, I mean, I have elements of that in my practice clinically, but I'm not an expert, but I'm like, when are we going to start measuring plastic load in people's bodies? When's that blood test going to start coming out? It's like, oh yeah, your load is this amount. And that's why you're having chronic joint pain and inflammation and your risk of cancer has gone up tenfold. I mean, the, the plastic, pro I am sorry, I'm going off on a little no, bit no, of a no, tangent. Because I'm going to add something to this that's going to blow your mind. I mean, this is what I talk about every day, you know, day in, day out. But so Dr. Anthony J, you know, the great Mayo Clinic researcher who wrote the book Astro Generation, who's absolutely, who happens to be a very close personal friend of mine. He won't really lecture anymore. He left the Mayo Clinic because they won't also acknowledge any of this stuff. But he says that, Jay, the average person living in the Midwest has no chance. They are being bombarded by atrazine and glyphosate in ways that they cannot comprehend. And it is sitting in the rinds of their visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And so many of these people are heavy slash obese mm -hmm. and it's not their fault. They're not eating like a quote unquote obese person would eat. They are literally contaminated with these microplastics and these uh, pesticides mm -hmm. that sit and lay in literally the rinds of the visceral fat and they cannot be metabolized, doc. It's insanity. I mean, so we just rabbit hole, but it really is true that they have to start measuring this, you know, in, you know, functional medicine or, you know, whatever we want to call it, you know, health optimization medicine, because it, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. It is. I know. And uh, yeah, 
<laughs> I feel like we're just all being lied to from the plastics industry. I mean, they, I'm sure they have the science to know how detrimental this is to, of course, of course, human health, but the whole planet's health. I mean, um, yeah, because the planet is a living, breathing being, as you know, yeah. with this Gaia. Yeah. Mother Earth it's not it's just microplastics Gaia. now, it's nanoplastics. Right. And right. and they're they they never go away, potentially, you know, and, and what that means to the long term health of this planet is very disturbing. I'm sh I'm sure some future species will come here that's conscious and smarter than us and will be like, oh yeah. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you can see these layers of civilization, and there'll be that plastic right. layer in the Earth sediment. <laughs> it's like, well, it's it's funny the, you say that. The because... plastic people lived during this three thousand year period, the and then they destroyed people. themselves. The plastic people. It makes me. It, it, it's like the joke. Uh, the shell. The shell Silverstein book. Uh, I once saw a woodpecker pecking out a plastic tree, and the woodpecker looked up at me and said, "Things ain't like they used to be." <laughs> But it's true. And, and to your point, uh, listen, man, history has, you know, if you're a student of history, like I am, you know, and obviously people can go do Graham Hancock and get that. But like I go way deeper. I'm obviously massively into the esoteric side of things. This planet has been through extinction level events many times. And knowing what you and I both know, practicing the power of all, doing our internal and meditative and contemplative practices, when Mother Earth has had enough, she will shake the fleas, the plastic people, the plastic beings off, and we will reboot, Michael. It will reboot, and that's how it works. And you know, hopefully you and I and our children are not around when that time comes. But if things don't change, it will come. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at the giant plastic blob, right, floating around in the Pacific Ocean that they know about now, right? Th Michael, do you realize I didn't know this? Somebody told me this two weeks ago. They take tours out to the blob. Oh, the people pay money <laughs> to go out to the blob. That's sick. <laughs> it is sick, but that's literally happening on this planet. So, you know, to get to segue this into this conversation, like yeah. the power of awe, practicing these micro awe moments is really the key to raising consciousness. So that we can actually stake, start taking ecological responsibility for not just ourselves, but the planet. Yeah. I, I'd love to read our epilogue because we kind of touch on all this. If, Please do. If you want me to, to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because, you know, what we've talked about in terms of our research and um, is really the individual's health benefits of awe. But of we, we believe that the benefits are way beyond just the individual. Yeah. Um, this is from our epilogue. So the implications of awe go well beyond personal transformation. Awe touches everything and perhaps most telling is the effect it has on others. We're wired to attune to others' behaviors and moods. Our nervous system senses the emotions of those around us. Just as being the recipient of a warm smile can lighten our mood, when we're in awe, those around us feel it too. Awe is contagious, and so practicing the awe method is not one not so small way to contribute to the world. In this book, we covered how the awe method is grounded in science, and that a whole body of science supports that awe changes lives. So we have a big simple crash ending to the power behind the simple practice of the awe method. If practiced frequently enough by enough people, a critical mass as it were, everyone would experience a significant heightened shift and consciousness. Awe changes us and we share our awe, we change the world. How can we be in awe of someone and physically or emotionally harm them? How can we be in awe of the natural world and destroy it? How can we be in awe of life itself and not live as if every day were a miracle? In awe, the tone of every conversation from personal to political shifts from having an agenda to being open and curious. Our conversations impact how we raise our kids, how we help our aging parents, how we treat our spouse, how we participate in community, how we mentor, supervise people, how we govern a city and how we lead a nation. We can think of no downside to practicing the awe method because awe is the light, the appreciation of nature and different cultures, the curious and open mind, the generous and giving soul. 
During these times of darkness, we need awe more than ever. So awe awaits you and surrounds you in the ordinary moments of your life. Like the view of the stars that fill the night sky, awe is free and always available. All you need to do is pay attention to what you value, appreciate, and find amazing. Wait, and then exhale and expand into the unlimited timelessness of awe. That's amazing, man. Did you write that? <laughs> yeah, we wrote that. <laughs> Both of you guys wrote that together. That was yeah. Uh, it, that's awesome. I mean, that's really awesome. I mean, whenever yeah. you write like something that's that moving in a book, it it's it's worth re you know rereading and 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 really probably for you guys, you guys have probably memorized it at this point. But um, you know, I've written a couple of passages in some of my books that are like that too. Like I, in my recent book, I wrote a passage which I'll send to you because I think you'll find a lot. You'll really like it. It's it's a very profound piece, but it's about the love and trust of self. Hmm. and it's in the beginning of my uh, fa newest fa fasting book. But I tell people like you will never ever get the body that you ultimately desire until you actually feel worthy of getting it. And hmm. until you can get to a place where you truly love and trust yourself, you will always sabotage. You will always go back to the old habits. And so it's like very intricately linked to the power of all. And just if you were practicing all, all the time, you would absolutely love and trust yourself because you would understand the value of it. Yeah. Whereas I think you think about this, Michael, like that was so beautiful, by the way, beautifully well-written. I can't wait. That's one of the main things of, that's come from this podcast today is like, okay, I got to finish this book in the next two days. Cause I read prolifically <laughs> and I started to read it literally just like right when you guys sent it to me, but then I've just been so busy creating and whatever. But, um, People are conditioned out of the womb to feel not worthy. Mm -hmm. Our society teaches through every construct, I don't have to name them, that you are a quote unquote sinner and that you are meaningless or worthless or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like the 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 journey, the the the, the traveling, the gift is recognition that you are worthy and that you are a powerful sovereign free soul and you can choose the power of all you can choose to love and trust yourself but so many people get sidetracked you know again because the narrative pushes the opposite yeah so sad but true you're right and um we need to we carry with us a, a good toolbox of uh, various tools whether it's a gratitude practice mind different mindfulness practices and awe practice um to really take care of ourselves and to reset our nervous systems and to love ourselves and to value ourselves. It's beautiful. To know man. that we are, um, that we have those qualities of God consciousness within us. Yes. Yes. It's amazing, man. I'm so grateful to have met you and for you to come on the show here today. So guys and gals and all the amazing people that watch the Jay Campbell podcast as always support the amazing and, and, and incredible individuals that come on like Michael. And uh, I would love to meet your co-author too. I'm sure he's somewhat like you. It seems like if he's a little bit older, you probably was a mentor of yours, right? Is that kind of the way he was? Yeah, exactly. Jake was my mentor. And um, so we met when I went through a divorce, uh, I guess almost 20 years ago now. And uh, um, he's been a, a big, um, a big fan of mine and uh, a big <laughs> just an incredible teacher and mentor. I love his work. So I'm That's definitely going to make sure you guys have an interview together sometime soon. I think amazing. you'll love it. Yeah. Please do yeah. that. And your listeners uh, will I, really appreciate what he's up to. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And then also, uh, guys and gals, please. I mean, I'm reading the book right now. It really is a profound book, but go to the power of all.com, pick up the book. It's also available of course on Amazon and remember raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We were going to see all of you guys very soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank you so much.